those who are beginning to return, nice to see visitors with us this morning as well from long distances. Paul. <laughs> And uh, great to have our children's ministry and Christ ministry beginning again today. That means our families and our children can really come back into church life again. And thank you for all those who are participating. Don't forget there's several rotas on the go, our tea and coffee rota, our stewarding rotas. So please do think about getting involved again and beginning to participate again in church life. If you have your Bible, could you turn with me to Mark chapter 5? I'm just going to continue our look at Mark this morning. And uh, the last time we looked at the healing of the, the demon-possessed man in the first part of Mark 5. And this morning, we'll take a look at the next section from verse 21. And let's read this together. So verse 21, Mark 5, which says, When Jesus was again, was, had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came, came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went So Jesus went with him a large crowd followed and pressed around him verse 25 and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had yet instead of getting better she grew worse when she heard about Jesus she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought if I just touch his clothes I will be healed immediately her healing her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering at once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him he turned around in his in, in the crowd and asked who touched my clothes you see the people crowding against you his disciples answered and yet you can ask who touched me but Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and with trembling with fear and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, this is verse 35 now, while Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He, looked, he took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. It's quite a long reading, but a wonderful story of two parts. The scriptures tell us in 1 Corinthians 13, 14, 13, 4 rather, that love is kind. Today we have an opportunity to see the real kindness of the Lord Jesus Christ to two suffering people, actually a suffering family and a suffering lady. If you were describing our world, would you describe it as kind? Isn't there so much harshness, heartlessness, and cruelty about? What is it that brings human beings contentment most, I wonder? I think the answer is simple. It's loving relationships. You know, no matter how much money you have or how much material wealth you accumulate, if one's heart is, is empty of love, 
One is sure to be in a state of emotional discomfort. And when we are afraid of others, or we compete with them, how can genuine relationships be formed and nurtured? You know, people lash out at each other all the time. And trust and friendship can be hard to find. The sin in this world, which the Bible describes, separates us from one another, causing us immense suffering. And that sense of separation invariably leads to us to behave in unkind ways. And that separates us from people even more. If we're unkind to others, we set them to become unkind towards us. Unless, that is, we break that cycle of unkindness and harshness. And unless we do that, we'll never be able to live with peace and joy. So with that in mind, our passage shows here the love of Jesus, the compassion of Jesus, the kindness of Jesus towards a man and a lady. One was an outcast, uh, poor, unknown, we don't even know her name. The other is well off, an influential person, a ruler of a synagogue. And yet Jesus treats them both with great kindness. By the time of this story, Jesus had already gained a great deal of popularity and fame, principally because of his healing ministry, but also because of his teaching ministry. People saw him as this teacher healer, this rabbi with a wonderful new message. And the crowd swarmed around him wherever he went. In fact, there were times whenever Jesus had to go off in private just to get some time for himself to rest and to pray. But in spite of the pressures and in spite of the crowds constantly pushing in around him, despite of all the demands on his time, Jesus in his kindness stopped everything he was doing to help people and their needs. One commentator has said this, love talked about is easily ignored, but love demonstrated is irresistible. Jesus not only talked the talk, but he walked the walk. He showed his love and his kindness and his compassion. And in doing so, he modeled it for us as well. First of all, notice in our story how Jesus pays attention to these two people and their needs. We see at the start of the story in verse 22 to 24, where Jesus has got out of the boat. He's come across the lake again from the place of the Gadarenes. He's going to teach the people about God. And that's why he's at the shore, really, as he's going to begin teaching again. But as he begins, a man named Jairus comes and falls on his knees. He's a synagogue ruler. Now, a synagogue ruler was more like an official administrator or steward of the assembly rather than a theologian. But he was a public figure. He would have been well-known and respected person in the community. He would have been a religious man. Him coming to Jesus carried with it some risks because already we saw in our stories previously that Jesus is attracting a lot of attention from the Pharisees and they're not very happy with him. They're already with the Herodians beginning to plot against Jesus. So it's a bit of a risk, such an important, influential synagogue person to come to Jesus. But put yourself in this man's shoes. I know what it's like to have a little daughter. They are the apple of your eye. And you want to guard them, and you want to protect them, and you want to take care of them. And Jairus seems here to be at the end of his rope. He's about to lose his precious girl through illness. So Jairus came and he interrupts Jesus while he was teaching. And he fell down on his knees and pleaded with him, My daughter is dying. Now it says immediately Jesus started following Jairus. Because this little girl's situation was much more pressing than whatever else Jesus had scheduled. And I think that's important. Because how do you deal with interruptions in your life? I don't always deal with them very well. Some people work best when they can concentrate on one thing and see it through to completion. And so if they're concentrating and if someone interrupts them, they consider that an intrusion. 
and they don't handle intrusions particularly well. But perhaps we need to learn something about the interruptions of life. Often the interruptions of life are sent by God. Opportunities to minister, to serve, that would be missed if we ignored them. I love the book by Larry Tomsack called Divine Appointments. In it, he describes how God every day puts in his path ways in which he can serve and minister to others, things in which he has not planned, often interruptions, often the happenstances of life, but, but nevertheless divinely sent by the Lord. Well, if we just go on with our projects and don't allow ourselves to be interrupted, if we aren't flexible enough to change directions occasionally and go in another way, we can often miss out on the great opportunities that God has placed before us. We need to leave some margin in our lives. I realize that I'm far too busy often and don't leave enough margin in my life for things that are occurring around me. I need to do that more. The Spirit of God then can often take us on in a little different track than we had planned. And that's often his guidance to us. Jesus paid attention to Jairus, but Jairus wasn't the only interruption. And Jesus was flexible and kind enough to pause and to meet another need as they were on their way to Jairus' home. And we need to leave that space for the unexpected. Often the unexpected things are the very purposes that God has for us. Verses 25 and 26. Let me just read those two verses. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent she, all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. That's not a great case for doctors, is it? <laughs> she had spent a lot on doctors and all they had done was not help her at all but make her worse. It's difficult for, un to, uh, for us to understand this woman's disease or her condition. But it put her outside of society. It made her a virtual excluded person, even within her own family. Because the continual bleeding, which may have been a menstrual problem, the woman would not have been or would have been continually regarded under Jewish law as being continuously ceremonially, ceremonially unclean, which meant that she could not be safely touched, even by her own husband, if she had one. Luke tells us in his gospel that she had had this condition for 12 years. She was most likely anemic, fatigued, worn out physically. She woke up ill in the morning, and she went to, Ill, she went to bed ill at night. On the, she had spent all she had on treatments and doctors and who knows what other remedies. She would have had relationship problems too with this condition. Under Levitical or Jewish law, uh, she was prohibited from entering the temple or the synagogue. She was labeled religiously unclean. She was no doubt felt alone, she maybe isolated maybe even abandoned by some, rejected, certainly on the outside of things. I'm sure so many years of ill health and chronic ill health had left her broken, stripped of her dignity and her worth. I wonder, did she feel bitter towards God? We don't know. Chronic ill health can do that to somebody. I wonder, did she doubt God's faithfulness? We're not told. But she must have heard about Jesus and she must have heard about his ability to heal. She didn't even have the, the courage to approach him face to face. She thought to herself, if I can just get to him, if I can just get near Jesus, if I could just touch him, I would be healed. Yes, I'll do that. I'll do that. No one told this woman to touch Jesus' clothes. That's not the normal healing method. But all that mattered was that she felt if she reached out to Jesus in faith. And friends, that's all that matters to us as well. 
Let me advise you today to do this, whatever problem, whatever issue you face, reach out to Jesus in faith. Reach out to him. Apparently, Jesus had a sense when supernatural power for healing had gone out of him. I find this very interesting because there is no direct action taken on Jesus' part. It's just the woman reaching out to him in faith who accessed the very power of God. Jesus didn't just channel the power of God like some guru or, or swami or something. No, Jesus wasn't using the power of God. He is the power of God. That's because Jesus is God. Whenever Jesus stopped in his tracks and asked, who touched me? The disciples are incredulous. What do you mean, who touched you? Look at the crowd jostling around you. Who touched you? But she knew. She knew something had happened to her. And perhaps she was trying to maybe slink away in some way. But Jesus turned around, and I'm sure his, his eyes fell upon her. Who touched me? I'm sure that she was terrified when she was identified because she had broken the purity laws. She had touched Jesus. Jesus was an important man. And she had made him ritually unclean by touching him. That's no small thing for a respected rabbi like Jesus. Any person she had touched in the crowd was also ritually unclean. Each of them would have to go through a process, according to the law, of ritual cleansing, which involved bathing, changing your clothes, and being alone until the evening time. She was in big trouble. Would Jesus be angry? Well, what I like about this story is that Jesus always makes time for people with real needs. This woman is a very ordinary person, especially compared to the, the synagogue ruler, Jairus. Yet Jesus stopped from that urgent and important mission because she reached out in faith to him. Maybe you need to take the plunge, friends. Maybe you need to take the plunge to reach out in faith to him today too. There may be something that you've had in your life for years that you need to be addressed, something you've been dealing with. Just like this lady, a chronic problem. One that maybe you've given up on ever finding relief from. Do you still believe that you can be healed? Do you still believe that you could be restored? If you reach out to him, if you trust the Lord today. Her self-esteem must have been as low as it could have possibly been. I imagine her as a small, insignificant woman. A lady who would have, be, who would have wanted to have slipped away especially into the crowd of people. So Jesus looks at her, and he focuses his attention on her, and he affirms her. He affirms her first by listening to her sad story. Verse 33, it says that she told him the whole truth. I like that. She told him everything. I imagine that she just poured out her heart to him. There were years and years there of emotion with tears probably. And Jesus listened. And by listening to her story and taking the time for her, he acknowledged her and he affirmed her and he showed her that she mattered to him and that he cared about her. It, helps, it, it reminds me to ask myself that, that very question too. How, what sort of listener am I? Do I give people time Many of us are not very good listeners. Although, as my mother used to say, Stephen, you've been given one mouth and two ears, so listen twice as much as you talk. Sometimes when we pass each other, we ask each other, how are you doing? Or how are you? And we expect an automatic, I'm fine. But have you ever been caught off guard and somebody tells you just how they are? For real? There's so many of us who just need someone to listen to us and give us some time to listen to us, to focus on us, to listen to what we have to say. It's an act of kindness on our part to do that. Even love, 
to really listen. Someone to acknowledge us. Someone that when we tell the story of our pain or our difficulty or our grief, then, then they're being supportive to us as we do. Then I think that Jesus also acknowledged her and affirmed her, not only by what he did, but by what he said to her. He said this, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. You know, in one sense, the healing had already taken place. Jesus confirms it, confirms it by these words. And what kind of wonderful affirmation that must have been. A woman who could not be in the company of other people, who perhaps hadn't felt a human touch for so long. And now Jesus says to her, daughter, not even woman. That's personal, isn't it? That's affectionate. That's kind. You see, that shows relationship. That brings her closer to Jesus in relationship. Then the answer to her long prayers, your faith has healed you. You can go on your way in peace. She was afraid he was going to be angry when the opposite was actually true. That's the kind of God we come to. Not an ogre, not an angry father ready to scold us and to slap us. No, a loving father who is more willing to give to us than we are to receive from him. That's amazing. A God who loves us so very much. Now, we don't know how long it took for Jesus to interact with the sick woman, but when he had finished, just as he had finished, word came to Jairus. In verse 35, it says, Some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? In verse 36, we are told Jesus overheard them, and he said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Now that is very interesting, because the emotion that Jesus identifies at hearing the news, according to Jesus, that emotion is fear. Fear is at the heart of so many of our problems. Your daughter is dead, they tell Jairus. It's too late. Nothing can help her now. Don't bother Jesus anymore. He didn't come in time. He didn't make it in time. So just, so just give up. It's like Jesus was saying to Jairus, what you are hearing and sensing is likely to bring great fear into your heart, but I want you to suspend and disregard that thought or emotion right now. Do not fear. Suspend that. Disregard that emotion that is rising within you. Then Jesus said immediately, only believe. Only believe. Do not fear, only believe. Now that's actually a command from Jesus. In essence, Jesus is saying to Jairus, do you trust me? Look at me, not the crowd, not the messengers. Do you trust me? Jairus had a choice to make. Believe the information of the messengers and the people around him or believe the word that was spoken to him by Jesus. We don't get his answer recorded, but it's obvious from what happened that Jairus did indeed trust Jesus. Isn't it interesting that both Jairus and the sick woman in our story both needed to respond to Jesus in faith and trust and obedience. And that's what we need as well. As well. I think of the old song, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. We need to keep on trusting the Lord, even though the circumstances around us may dictate something different. We need to trust Jesus. So what happens next? In verses 37 to 40, we read that Jairus and Jesus are surrounded by unbelief and ridicule. Let me just take a portion of that. They came to the house of the synagogue ruler, 
Jesus saw a commotion. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. And they laughed at him. So they're surrounded here with a certain amount of incredulity. In those days, there were professional mourners, keeners, who came around to each family. In our culture now, at funerals, even at wakes, a certain degree of stoicism is required. And it's often admired, you know. We don't like to see people weeping and wailing at a funeral. But then, in their culture of that day, it was expected. It was expected that there would be lots of weeping and wailing. In fact, the more weeping there was, the more it meant that there was a sense of loss to the family and the community. And so these neighbors, they didn't have any real sense of loss, or they wouldn't have laughed in verse 40. Why do you think Jesus put them out? Well, their laughter and their mocking showed that they had no faith or trust in what Jesus was about to do. Also, their laughter and their mocking undermined the parents' faith. After he put them out, he took the child's father and mother with Peter and James and John, you might notice, who were with him. And he went in to where the child was. Let me read verses 41 to 43. It says this. And he took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and walked, walked around. At this they were completely astonished. I find this very, very touching, actually. Maybe it's the way in which Jesus took the little girl's hand to raise her. He wouldn't have had to do that. But that's very tender, isn't it? Maybe it's those beautiful words in Aramaic that he said. Or maybe it's the sense of joy that would have been on the parents' faces. But there's, there's, there's something beautiful about those verses. Maybe it's the sense of astonishment at her immediate recovery. Immediate recovery. You know, it's always up to God how he answers our prayers. Jesus never seemed to perform one miracle the same as the next. There was always differences in them. And it's up to God how he answers our prayers too, in what way. But when it's a miracle like this, it's a great joy, isn't it? It's astonishment maybe, but great joy. Our part is always to trust the Lord when God, God is answering us. Will Jesus answer your prayer to our prayers, Jesus says, yes. And sometimes he says, no. And sometimes he says, wait. Maybe you've prayed forever to be released from something. But God never seems, never seems to answer you. Maybe it's just that the right time hasn't yet come. Or maybe God says like he did to the Apostle Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. We know the first part of that very well, but it's the last part that really grabs me. So that the power of God may rest on me. God gives me the strength, the courage, the energy, and the power to go through even chronic things. But I imagine that the lady in our story, I imagine that she prayed, and she prayed, and she prayed, and she prayed, and hundreds of times. I'm sure she prayed a lot. But for her, she needed to be there that day. She needed to be there with Jesus. She needed to reach out to him in faith that day to find relief from her suffering. For her, it was a long wait. But remember this, friends. Jesus always responds to our faith. 
What Jairus asked for, Jesus granted. He responds to us when we trust him. May I remind you that he is kind and loving because those who have had to wait a long time for, prayer, for answers to prayer really wonder about that. We might vocally express it, but do we mean it in the darkest moments? How do you trust Jesus? I mean, really, how do you trust Jesus? And do you trust him really? How many times do we find ourselves in situations where what we see or what happens around us demands that we lose heart or that we're fearful or that we're, we panic or that we're in despair or even that we get angry? Those of us who have been Christians, even for a long time, get continually tested in these areas. When tomorrow comes and a situation arises that tests me, will I lose heart? Will I get fearful? Will I panic? Will I get overwhelmed with despair? Will I get angry? Like Jairus on the path to his home, Jesus asks me the question, Despite what you hear, despite what you see, despite what you are feeling, will you trust me? Do you trust me? Amen. Let me pray. Lord, this morning, we want to reach out to you afresh this day. Lord, I pray especially this morning for those who have been ill chronically for a long time those who have had to deal with issues in their lives that never seem to be resolved, just like this lady who touched you, Lord. Lord, I pray today, can we find this faith again in, our, in you to reach out as if to touch the hem of your garment, to reach out and touch your clothes today, Lord, as you pass by. Lord, you're here now. You're with us now, Lord. By faith, you're here. And Lord, we want to reach out to you this morning. For those who are at home, maybe watching on Zoom, Lord, I pray this morning, will they have the courage and the strength of heart again, even though they've prayed many, many, many times, to reach out to you afresh this day for healing, for strength, for an answer to that prayer, for a response to that thing, Lord, which has bothered them for so many years. Lord, I pray, would you bring healing today? Lord, would you bring restoration today? Lord, would you touch a heart today in a fresh and a new way? Lord, we thank you that you are a wonder-working God, that you are powerful, that you are able, that you are ready. And so, Lord, we reach out to you today, Lord. We thank you for these wonderful stories, Lord, that show us the very heart of God, that show us God in human flesh, Jesus, the compassionate healer, the compassionate restorer, and so we want to praise and thank you, Lord. Lord, as we launch out into our working week, our school week, I pray, Lord, that you would take each one in our, in our church, each one, Lord, who is trusting you, and lead them, Lord, just as you did with this little girl, taking them by the hand and restoring them and leading them forward. I pray for each person, Lord, in our church, from the youngest child to the oldest adult, Lord, that you would lead and guide them in their path. Lord, pray that this week that they would again put fresh trust and faith in you for their personal situation. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, friends. God bless today. And uh, it's, um, it's good to have our tea and coffees restored as well. So 